light scarf mm. and a soft felt hat. <laughs> Most of us are warm against ice-bound roads. The heavy snow is expected to continue and run. Mahogany sideboard with great solid carved fruits on it? Yes, we have. In the dining room. In here? Oh, I simply must see. Oh, oh, Absolutely perfect. Real bedrock respectability. Oh, but why do away with a center mahogany table? The little tables just to spoil the effect. Oh, we thought our guests would prefer them. This is my husband. Oh, how do you do? Awful oh, weather, isn't it? <laughs> Take them back to Dickens and Scrooge and that irritating tiny Tim. It's so bogus. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Mrs. Ralston, you're absolutely right about the little tables. I was being carried away by my feeling for period. <laughs> No, if you had a center table, you'd have to have the right family around it. A stern, handsome father with a beard. Oh. <laughs> a prolific, faded mother. Eleven children of assaulted ages, a grim governess, and uh, somebody called a uh, poor Harriet. The poor relation who is a gentle dog's body and is very... Very grateful for being given a good home. <laughs> I'll take your suitcase upstairs for you. Oh, did you say? Yes. Oh, I do hope that it's got a four-poster with my little chintz roses. It hasn't. <laughs> Don't think your husband is going to like me. How long have you been married? Are you very much in love? We've been married just a year. Perhaps you'd like to come up and see your room. Ticked off. <laughs> but I do so like knowing all about people. I mean, I think people are madly interesting, don't you? Well, I suppose some are, and some are not. No. No, I don't agree. No, I think everyone is interesting. Because you never really know what anyone is like, or, or what they're really thinking. Uh, for instance, you don't know what I'm thinking about now, do you? Not in the least. You see? No, the only people who really know what other people are like are the artists. And even they don't know why they know it. <laughs> but if they're uh, portrait painters, it, it comes out on the canvas. Are you a painter? No. <laughs> no, I'm an architect. My parents, you know, baptized me Christopher in the hopes that I would become an architect. Christopher Wren, as good as halfway home. Of course, everybody laughs and makes jokes about St. Paul's. However, who knows? I may yet have the last laugh. Chris Wren's prefab nests may yet go down in history. No, I'm going to like it here. I find your wife most sympathetic. Indeed. And really, very beautiful. Oh, don't be absurd. There, isn't that just like an Englishwoman? Compliments always embarrass them. European women take compliments as a matter of course, but uh, English women have all the feminine spirit crushed out of them by their husbands. <laughs> yes, there's something dreadfully boorish about English husbands. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Into the fire. 
before. Terrible weather, isn't it? Is this all your luggage? Um, Major Metcalf is in his seen to it. I'll leave the door for him. We had to share a taxi from the station. And there was great difficulty in getting that. Nothing ordered to meet us, it seems. Oh, so sorry. Um, we didn't know a train would be coming by, you see. Otherwise, of course, we'd have had someone uh, standing by. All trains should have been met. Let me take your coat. My wife will be down in a moment. I'll just go and help wet car with the bags. Oh, the drive at least, at least might have been cleared of snow. Or oh, very casual and offhand, I must say. I'm so sorry, I... Mrs. Ralston? Yes, I... You're very young. Young? To be running an establishment of this kind. Can't have had much experience. There has to be a beginning for everything, hasn't there? I see. Quite inexperienced. <laughs> An old house, too. I hope you haven't got dry rot. Certainly not. No, a lot of people don't know they've got dry rot. And <laughs> it's too late to do anything about it. <laughs> the house is in perfect condition. <laughs> it could do with a coat of paint. <laughs> This way, Major. This is my wife. Uh, 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 how do you do? Uh, absolute blizzard outside. I thought at one time we shouldn't make it. Uh, uh, your pardon. Uh, if it keeps up like this, why, I should say, we'll have five or six feet of snow by morning. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it since I was on leave in 1940. Uh, I'll take these off. Which rooms did you say? Blue room and the rose room? Uh, no, Mr. Ren is the rose room. He liked the fall coaster so much. So it's Mrs. Boyle in the oak room and Major Metcalf in the blue room. Major! Stop! <laughs> Do you have good servant difficulty here? Uh, we have quite a good local woman who comes into the village. And what in your staff? No in your staff, just us. Indeed. I understood that this was a guest house in full running order. We are only just starting. I should have said that a proper staff of servants was essential before opening this kind of establishment. I consider your advertisement most misleading. May I ask if I am the only guest with Major Metcalf, that is? No, there are several here. And this weather, too? <laughs> A blizzard, no less. <laughs> All very unfortunate. But we couldn't very well foresee the weather. The north wind got blow, and it will bring snow. And what will the robin do then? Poor thing. Oh, ah. Ah, I adore nursery rhymes, don't you? Always so tragic and macabre. And that's why children like them. <laughs> Mr. Red, Mrs. Boyd. How do you do? This is a very beautiful house, don't you think so? I have come to the time of life when the amenities of an establishment are more important than its appearance. If I had not believed this was a running concern, I should never have come here. I understood it was fully equipped with every home comfort. There is no obligation for you to remain here if you're not satisfied, Mrs. Boyle. No, indeed, I wouldn't think of so. If there has been any misapprehension, perhaps it would be better if you went elsewhere. I could bring up the taxi to return. The roads are not yet blocked. We had so many applications for rooms, you see, that it should be quite easy for us to fill your place. At any rate, we are raising our terms next month. I am certainly not going to leave before I've tried what this place is like. You needn't think that you can turn me out now. Perhaps you would see me up to my bedroom, Mrs. Take this, 
Is there any more stuff in the car? No, no, I travel light. Oh, ah, glad to see you've got a good fire. Mr. Wren, Miss... Caswell. My wife began in a moment. No, no hurry, no hurry. Got to get myself thawed out. <laughs> Looks as though you're going to be snowed up here. Weather forecast says heavy falls expected, motorists warned, etc. Hope you've got plenty of provisions in. Oh, yes. My wife is an excellent manager. At any rate, we can always eat our eggs. We always start eating each other, eh? <laughs> oh, any news in the paper, apart from the weather? The usual political crisis. Oh. Ah, yes, and a rather juicy murder. Murder? <laughs> oh, I like murder. They seem to think it was a homicide from maniac. Strange woman somewhere near Paddington. Sex maniac, I suppose. Well, it doesn't say much, does it? The police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity of Culver Street at the time. Medium height, wearing darkish overcoat, lightish scarf, and soft felt hat. Police messages to this effect have been broadcast throughout the day. Useful description. Fit pretty well anyone, wouldn't it? But when it says the police are anxious to interview someone, is that a polite way of hinting that he's the murderer? Could be. Who was the woman who was murdered? Uh, Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Maureen Lyon. Young or who? Doesn't say. Doesn't appear to have been robbery. I told you. Sex maniac. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Miss Casewell, Polly. My wife. Ah! Oh, Georgia, it's an awful night. Would you like to come up to your room? The water's hot if you'd like a bath. All right, I would. <laughs> Madam, <laughs> a guest house. 
and the chap impostors. <laughs> My Rolls Royce, alas, has run into a snow, blinding snow everywhere. I do not know what I am. Perhaps I think to myself I would freeze to death. But then I take a little bag, I stagger up through the snow. I see before me big iron gates, a habitation I am saved. Twice I fall into the snow as I come up your drive, but at last I arrive and immediately despair turns to joy. You can only have a room, yes? Uh, yes. It's a rather small one, I'm afraid. Ah, naturally, naturally. You have other guests. We've only just opened this place as a guest house today, so we're rather new at it. Oh, charming. <laughs> charming. What about your luggage? That is of no consequence. I have locked the car securely. But it would be better to get it in. No. <laughs> no. I can assure you, on such a night as this, there will be no thieves abroad. And as for me, all my wants are very simple. I have all that I need here in this little bag. <laughs> yes. All that I need. <laughs> You'd better get thoroughly warm. I'll go see you about your room. I'm afraid it's rather cold room because the place is north, but all the others are occupied. You have several guests, then? Yes, there's Mrs. Boyle, and Major Metcalf, and Miss Casewell, and a young man called Christopher Wren. And now you. Yes! <laughs> the unexpected guest! The guest that you did not invite! The guest that arrived from nowhere! Out of the storm! Some dramatic though did not. Who am I? You do not know. Where do I come from? You do not know. Me! I am the man of mystery. <laughs> but now I tell you this, I complete the picture. From now on, there will be no arrivals and no departures either. By tomorrow, perhaps even already, we are cut off from civilization. <coughs> no butcher, no baker, no meatman, no postman, no daily paper, nothing and no one but ourselves. That is admirable. Admirable. It could not suit me better. <clears throat> My name, by the way, is Parvacini. Yes, ours is Ralston. Mr. Mrs. Ralston. And this is Monswell Man, a guest house, you said. Good. Monswell Man, a guest house. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> 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 Stay here, Bob. No! 
No, I don't suppose you will. <laughs> really, that is a very peculiar young man. Maybe he unbalanced, I shouldn't wonder. And you think he's escaped from an insane asylum? I shouldn't be a fool surprised. Giles! Yes? You trouble the snow waving from the back door. Come in. Uh, I would give you a hat. What? Uh, good exercise. <laughs> Yeah, must have exercise. No. Sorry, oh, that's all right. Oh, really? What an incredible young woman! How did she know anything about housework? Carrying a vacuum through the front rooms. Are oh, there any back stairs? Oh, yes. Very nice back stairs. Very convenient if there was a fire. And why not use them? Ah, oh, anyway, all of the housework ought to be done this morning, before luncheon. I gather our hostess had to cook the lunch. Oh, very haphazard and amateurish. There ought to be a proper staff. Not very easy to get nowadays, is it? Oh, no, indeed. The lower classes seem to have no idea of their responsibilities. <laughs> Poor old lower classes. Put the bit between their teeth, haven't they? I gather you are a socialist. No, I wouldn't say that. I'm not a red. It's pale pink. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't take much interest in politics. I live abroad. Uh, I suppose conditions are much easier abroad. Well, I don't have to cook and clean, as I gather most people have to do in this country. This country has gone sadly downhill. Not what it used to be. I sold my house last year. Everything was just too difficult. Hotels and guest houses are easier. They certainly do solve some of one's problems. Are you over in England for long? Well, it depends. I've got some business to tend to. When it is finished, I shall go back. To France? No. Italy? No. Sounds 
two, two, grim. What is it? A novel? You didn't know I was a writer, did you? Oh, are you? Sorry to disappoint you. Actually, I'm not. Hmm. Indeed. 
Now, there was a young lady. I must be getting on with my letters. I'll see if it's any warmer in the drawing room. My charming hostess looks upset. What is it, dear lady? Everything's rather difficult this morning because of the snow. Yes, snow makes things difficult, does it not? Or it makes things easy. <laughs> yes, very easy. I don't know what you mean. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, there's quite a lot you do not know. I think, for one thing, that you do not know very much about running a guest house. I dare say we don't, but we need to make a go of it. Oh, bravo, bravo. <laughs> I'm not such a very bad cook. You are without a doubt a most enchanting cook. May I give you a little word of warning, Miss Gladstone? You and your husband shouldn't be so trusting, you know. Have you any references of these guests of yours? Is that usual? I always thought people just Kate. It is advisable to know a little about the people that sleep under your roof. Take, for example, myself. <laughs> I turn out saying that my car attending a snow drift, but what do you know? Nothing at all. I could be a thief, a robber, a fugitive from justice, a madman, even a murderer. Oh. Ah, you know just as little of your other guests. Oh, well, as far as Mrs. Boyle oh. goes, the drawing room is only cold to sit in. I shall finish my letters here. Allow me to poke the fire for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Ralston, is your husband about? Uh, the pipes and the downstairs uh, <coughs> coke crew are frozen. Oh dear, what an awful day. First the police, now the pipes. <coughs> uh, they went up. Just now, to say there's only a sergeant out here. Uh, but I don't think he'll ever get here. What he cloaks more than half the stone to the prize was. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Anything the matter? I hear the police are on their way here. Why? That's all right. No one can get through with this. Why, the drapes must be five feet deep. The roads are all banked up. No one will get here today. Excuse me, Mr. Parvachini, man. Put these down. <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 Are you Mr. Ralston? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Detective Sergeant Trotter, Berkshire Police. Uh, can I get these skis off and stow them somewhere? <laughs> Go back to the I'll meet you. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> I suppose that's what we pay our police forces for nowadays. To go about enjoying themselves as we just walked. <laughs> Why did you send for the police, Mrs. Ralston? No, but I didn't. Who was that man? Where did he come from? He went by the drawing room window on skis, all over snow and looking terribly hearty. You may believe it or not, but that man is a policeman. <laughs> a policeman. Ski. Uh, this is Detective Sergeant Trotter. Uh, good afternoon. You can't be a sergeant. You're too young. I'm not quite as young as I look, madam, but terribly hearty. <laughs> we'll stow your skis away under the back stairs. Excuse me, Mrs. Ralston, may I use your telephone? Of course, Major Metcalf. It's very attractive, don't you think so? No, I think that the are very attractive. <laughs> no brains, one can see them at the glass. Hello? Hello? Mrs. Rosson, this phone is dead. It's quite dead. But it was all right about half an hour ago. Oh, the lines must be down with the weight of the snow, I suppose. So we're quite cut off now, huh? <laughs> quite cut off. That, that's rather funny, isn't it? Well, I don't see anything to laugh at. No, indeed. Uh, uh, no, it's a, it's a private joke of my own. <laughs> Just move this attention. Now, you get to business, Mr. Ralston. Mrs. Ralston. Would you like to see us alone? If so, we can go to the library. Uh, it's not necessary, so it'll save time if everybody's present. Oh, do hurry up and tell us. What have we done? Done? Oh, oh, it's nothing of that kind, Mrs. Ralston. It's something quite different. It's more a matter of police protection, if you understand me. Police protection? Now, it, it relates to the death of a, uh, of a Mrs. Maureen Lyon of 24 Calder Street, London, West Poo, who was murdered yesterday, thinking instantly. You may have heard already about the case. Yes, I heard it on the wires. The woman who was strangled. 
Oh, that's right, madam. The first thing I want to know is if you were acquainted with this Mrs. Lyme. Never heard. You may have known her under the name of Lyme. Lyme wasn't her real name. She, uh, she had a police record and her fingerprints were on file, so we were able to identify her without difficulty. Her, her real name was uh, Maureen Stanning. Her husband was a farmer, John Stanning, who resided at a, uh, at a Long Ridge farm. It's not very far from here. Long Ridge farm? Isn't that where those children were? Yes. The Long Ridge farm case. Three children. Uh, that's right, miss. Um, the, the Corrigans. Two boys and a girl brought before the court as in need of care and protection. A home was found for them, Mr. and Mrs. Stanning at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died as the result of criminal neglect and persistent ill treatment. The case made a bit of a sensation at the time. It was horrible. Uh, the Stannings were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Stanning died in prison. Um, Mrs. Stanning served a sentence and was duly released. Now, yesterday, as I say, she was found strangled at 24 Culver Street. Who did it? <laughs> I'm coming to that, madam. Um, a notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime. In that notebook was written two addresses. One was 24 Culver Street, and the other was Monswell Manor. What? Yes, sir. That's why Superintendent Hogben, on receiving this information from Scotland Yard, thought it imperative for me to come out here and to find out if you knew of any connection between this house or anyone in this house and the Long Ridge Farm case. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. It must be a coincidence. Well, Superintendent Hogben doesn't think it is a coincidence, sir. He'd have come himself if it had been in any way possible. Now, under the weather conditions, and uh, as I can ski, he sent me um, with instructions to get full particulars of everyone in the house, to report back to him by phone, and to take what measures I thought fit to ensure the safety of the household. Safety? But what kind of danger does he think we are in? Good Lord, surely he doesn't think someone's going to be killed here. Oh, well, I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, but uh, frankly, yes. That seems to be my idea. But why? That's what I'm here to find out. But the whole thing's crazy. Yes, so it's because it's crazy that it's dangerous. Oh, nonsense. I must say, it seems a bit far-fetched. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you haven't told us, Sergeant? Um, yes, Mrs. Ralston. Below the two addresses was written three blind mice. And on the dead woman's body was a paper with uh, this is the first written on it. And below the words, a drawing of three little mice and a bar of music. The music was to the tune of the nursery rhyme, Three Blind Mice. Uh, you know how it goes, um, Three Blind Mice. Three, three Blind Mice, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife. It was horrible. There were three children, one died. Yes, yes, the youngest, a boy of eleven. What happened to the others? Um, uh, the girl was adopted by somebody. We haven't been able to trace her present whereabouts. The elder boy would now be uh, poorly grown, deserted from the army, has not been heard of since. According to the army psychologist, was definitely schizophrenic. Hmm. So, uh, a bit queer in the head, that's to say. They think it was he who killed Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Stanley. Yes. And that he's a homicidal maniac. And that he will turn up here and try to kill someone, but why? That's what I've got to find out from you. As the superintendent sees it, there must be some connection. Now, now you state, sir, that you yourself never had any connection with the Longridge Farm case. No. And then the same goes for you, madam. I. No, I'm no connection. Now, what about servants? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's quite all right, Mrs. Robson. Uh, now, can I have all your names, please? Oh, this is ridiculous. We are merely staying in a kind of hotel. <clears throat> we only arrived yesterday, and we've got nothing to do with the place. Uh, you, you planned your trips here in advance, though. You've booked your rooms here ahead. Well, yes, of course. We will ex 
set, Mr. <laughs> Paravagini. <laughs> My God, attending a snow drift. I see. Um, what I'm getting at is that anyone who's been following you around might know very well that you were coming here. Now, um, there's just one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quick. Which one of you is it that has some connection with that business at Longridge Farm? Well, you're not being very sensible, are you? But one of you is in danger, deadly danger. I've got to know which one that is. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll ask you one by one. You first, since you seem to have arrived here more or less by accident, Mr. Right? Para, para Bacini. But, my dear inspector, I know nothing but nothing of what you talk about. I'm a stranger in this country. I know nothing of these local affairs of bygone years. <laughs> Time I was stationed in Edinburgh. No personal knowledge. And you? Christopher Wren. I was a mere child at the time. I don't even remember hearing anything about it. And that's all you have to say? Any of you? Well, if one of you gets murdered, you'll have yourself the blame. <laughs> uh, now then, Mr. Ralston, can I have a look around the house? Oh, 
come from last night. I don't know. He looks a bit of a spirit to me. Makes his face up too rouge and powder. Disgusting. And he must be quite old, too. Uh, that he skips about as though he were quite young. Mm. You'll be wanting more wood. I'll get it. It's almost dark, and yet it's only four in the afternoon. I'll go turn on the lights. That's better. It's just 
facts. You got a description of what this man looked like in London? Mm. Uh, a medium height, indeterminate build, darkish overcoat, a uh, soft felt hat, face hidden by a scarf, spoke in a whisper. <coughs> there are three darkish overcoats hanging up in the hall now. Uh, one of them is yours, Mr. Ralston. Uh, there are three lightish felt hats. I still can't believe it. You see, it's this telephone wire that worries me. It's been cut. I must go and get on with the vegetables. Is there an extension? I beg your pardon, did you say something? Yes, Mr. Ralston, I said, is there an extension? Yes, I'll be right back. Go and try it up there for me, will you? You all held out on me. 
And now, unless we get to the bottom of this event quickly, mine, there may be another death. And no, no, why? Because there are three little blind minds. A death for each of them. Well, there'd have to be some connection. Another connection, I mean. To the Long Ridge Farm business. Yes, yes, there would have to be that. But why another death here? Because there were three little blind minds. And there were there was two there were two addresses in the notebook we found. Now at, at 24 Colby Street, there was only one possible victim. But here, at Monkswell Manor, there is a wider field. No. Surely it would be a most unlikely coincidence that there should be two people brought here by chance, both of them with a share in the Longridge Farm case. Given certain circumstances, it wouldn't be so much of a coincidence. But think it out, Miss Casewell. Now, I want to get down quite clearly where everyone was when Mrs. Boyle was killed. I, I already have Mrs. Ralston's statement. Um, you were in the kitchen, preparing vegetables. You came out of the kitchen, along the hall, in here. The, the radio was blaring, but the light switched off, and the hall was dark. You, you switched the light on, saw Mrs. Boyle, and screamed. Yes, I screamed and screamed, and at last, people came. Yes, yes, as you say, people came. A lot of people from different directions, all arriving, more or less, at once. Now, uh, when I got out of that window to trace the telephone wire, you, Mr. Ralston, went upstairs to the room that you and Mrs. Ralston occupied to try the extension telephone. Where were you when Mrs. Ralston screamed? I was still up in our bedroom. The extension telephone was dead, too. I opened the window to see if I could see any sign of the wires being cut. I couldn't. I closed the window, I heard boys scream, and I came right down. Those simple actions took you a rather long time, didn't they, Mr. Ralston? Don't think so. Well, I should say you definitely took your time over them. I was thinking about something. <laughs> Very well. And Mr. Wren, I'll have your account of where you were. I would be in the kitchen, seeing if there was anything I could do to help Mrs. Ralston. I had to walk cooking. After that, I went upstairs to my bedroom. Why? What's well, quite a natural thing, isn't it, to want to go to one's bedroom? I mean, one does want to be alone sometimes. You went to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone. And I wanted to brush my hair and tidy up. You wanted to brush your hair? Anyway, that's where I was. And, uh, and you heard Mrs. Ralston scream. Yes. And you came down. Yes. Curious that you and Mr. Ralston didn't meet on the stairs. I went down the back stairs. They're closer to my bedroom. Hmm. Did you go through your room by the back stairs, or did you come through here? I went up and by the back stairs, too. I see. Mr. Paravicini. I have told you. I was playing the piano in the drawing room. Through the air, Inspector. Oh, I'm not an inspector. <laughs> Just a sergeant. Um, could anyone hear you playing the piano? I don't think so. I was playing very, very softly with one... Finger. <laughs> <laughs> you came three blind mice. Is that so? Yes. It is a very catchy little tune. It is a, <clears throat> how shall I say, a bonding little tune. Don't you agree? I think it's horrible. And yet, it runs in people's heads. Someone was whistling at two. Whistling? Where? I'm not quite sure. Perhaps in the hall, perhaps in the stairs, perhaps upstairs in one of the bedrooms. Who was whistling three blind mice? Are you making this up, Mr. Paravicini? No, no, Inspector. Forgive me, <laughs> Sergeant. <laughs> I will never do a thing like that. Well, go on. You were playing the piano. With one finger. So. <laughs> and then I heard the radio playing very loud. Someone was shouting on me. It offended my ears. Then after that, suddenly, <coughs> I hear Mrs. Radstone scream. Mr. Ralston upstairs, Mr. Wren upstairs, Mr. Paravicini in the drawing room. Miss Casewell. I was writing letters in the library. Could you hear what was going on in here? No, I didn't hear anything until Mrs. Walston screamed. And what did you do then? Came in here. At once? I think so. 
you say you were writing letters when you heard Mrs. Ralston scream. Yes. And that you got up from the writing table hurriedly and came in here. Yes. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any unfinished letter on the writing desk in the library. I brought it with me. Dearest Jessie, hmm. a friend of yours or a relation? That's none of your damned business. Perhaps not. You know, if I were to hear someone screaming blue murder when I was writing the letter, I don't believe I'd take the time to pick up my unfinished letter, fold it, and put it in my pocket before going to see what was the matter. You wouldn't. How interesting. <laughs> Now then, Major Metcalf, what about you? Uh, you said you were in the cells. Why? Looking around. Not just looking around. I, I looked in that cupboard under the stairs near the kitchen, got some jumped and sports tackle, and I noticed another door inside it. Well, I opened the door and I saw a flight of steps. I was curious, so I went down. Uh, nice cellars you've got, by the way. Glad you like them. Oh, not at all. The crypt of an old monastery, I should say. And probably why it's called Monkswell. We're not engaged in antiquarian research here, Major Metcalf. We're investigating a murder. Yeah. Now, Mrs. Ralston has told us that she heard a door shut with a faint creak. That particular door shuts with a creak. It could be, you know, that after killing Mrs. Boyle, the murderer heard Mrs. Ralston coming from the kitchen and slipped into that cupboard, pulling the door to after him. A lot of things could be. There would be fingerprints on the inside of the cupboard. Well, mine are there, all right. But then, of course, most criminals are careful to wear gloves, aren't they? Well, as usual. But all criminals slip up sooner or later. <laughs> I do wonder, Sally, if that is really true. Look here. Aren't you wasting time? There's one person. Yes. Mr. Ralston, I am in charge of this investigation. Very well. But I'm not going to see Mr. Ralston! Thank you, sir. Now, we've got to establish opportunity, you know, as well as motive. Let me tell you this. You all have opportunity. <laughs> Well, there are two staircases. Anyone could go up by one and come down by the other. Anyone could go down to the cellars by the door near the kitchen and come up by a flight of steps that leads through a trapdoor to the foot of the stairs over there. The vital fact was that every one of you was alone at the time this murder was committed. Look here, Sergeant, you speak as though we are all under suspicion. That's absurd. In a murder case, everyone is under suspicion. But you know pretty well who killed that woman at Cornwall Street. You think it was the eldest of those three children of the farm? A mentally abnormal young man. Damn it. There's one person who fits the myth. <laughs> That's not true. You, you, you are all against me. Everyone's always been against me. You're going to frame me for these murders. It's persecution. That's what it is. It's persecution. No, steady. All right, Chris. Nobody's against you. But tell him it's all right. We don't. People. Tell him you're not going to arrest him. I've not arrested anyone. To do that, I've got to have evidence. Have you got any evidence? Yes. I think you're crazy, Molly. And you too! There's one person here who fits the bill, and if only as a safety measure, he ought to be put under arrest. You! It's only fair to arrest him. Oh, wait, Giles, wait. Sergeant Trotter, can I speak to you a minute? Uh, certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Uh, will the rest of you go into the dining room, please? I stay. No, Giles, you too. I stay, Molly. I don't know what to move with you. Yes, Mrs. Ralston. What is it that you wanted to say to me? Sergeant Trotter, you think that this crazy killer must be the eldest of the two boys at the farm, but you do not know that, do you? We don't actually know a thing. All we've got so far is that 
The woman who joined with her husband in starving and ill-treating those children has been killed. And the woman magistrate who is responsible for placing them there has been killed. The telephone wire that links me with police headquarters has been cut. You don't even know that. It may have just been the snow. No. Mrs. Ralston, the line was deliberately cut. It was cut just outside by the front door. I found the place. I see. Sit down, Mrs. Ralston. It's all the same. You don't know. I'm going by probability. It all points one way. Mental instability, childish mentality, desertion from the army, and the psychiatrist's report. Oh, I know, and therefore it all seems to point to Christopher, but I do not believe that it is Christopher. There must be other possibilities. Such as? Well, have those children any relations at all? Oh. Now, the mother wasn't drunk. She died soon after the children were taken away from her. But what about their father? He was an army sergeant. Serving abroad. If he's alive, he's probably discharged from the army by now. Mm -hmm. You don't know where he is now. Uh, we, we've no information. You know, to trace him may take some time, but I can assure you, Mrs. Ralston, that the police take every eventuality into account. But, but you don't know where he may be at this minute. And if the mm -hmm. father is mentally unstable, the son may have been unstable too. Well, it's a possibility. When I said the police had run off, Major Metcalf was frightfully upset. He really was. I saw his face. Major Metcalf? Middle-aged, a soldier. He seems quite nice and perfectly <coughs> normal, but it might show, might it? No, often it doesn't show at all. And Mr. Parvincini did drop the poker when I said the police had run up. Mr. Parvincini? I know he seems quite old and foreign and everything, but he might be really as old as he looks. He's definitely got makeup on his face. Miss Case will notice it too. He might be... Oh, I know it seems quite melodramatic, but... He might be disguised. You're very anxious, aren't you, that it shouldn't be young Mr. Wren? <coughs> so helpless, somehow, and so unhappy. Mrs. Ralston, let me tell you something. I have had all possibilities in mind ever since the beginning. The boy, Georgie, um, the father, and, and someone else that there was a sister, you remember. Oh, a sister? It could have been a woman who killed Maureen Lyon. The scar pulled up and the man fell back, pulled well down. Yes, yes, it might have been a woman. Miss Casewell? She looks a bit old for the part. Yes, Mrs. Boston, there is a very wide field. There's yourself, for instance. Me? You're about the right age. Oh. No. No, whatever you're going to tell me now, I've got no means of checking it at this moment. Remember. And then there's your husband. <laughs> Giles, how ridiculous. He and Christopher Wren are much of an age. The actual age is very hard to tell. How much do you know about your husband, Mrs. Ralston? How much do I know about Giles? And don't be silly. Uh, you've been married. How long? Just a year. And you met him where? At a dance in London. We went in a party. Do you mean his people? He hasn't got any people. They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> They're all dead? Yes, but oh, you make it sound all wrong. His father was a barrister and his mother died when he was a baby. Oh, you're only telling me what he told you. Yes, but... You don't know it of your own knowledge. It's outrageous. You'd be surprised, Mrs. Ralston, if you knew how many cases rather like yours we get, especially since the war. Homes broken up and families dead. Bella says he's been in the Air Force and just completed his army training. Parents killed, no relations. How long had you known Giles Ross when you married him? Just three weeks, but... And you don't know anything about him? That's not true. I, I know everything about him. I know exactly the sort of person he is. He's, <laughs> he's Giles. And it's absolutely absurd of you to suggest that he's some horrible, crazy, homicidal maniac. Why, he wasn't even in London yesterday when we went to the place. Where was he? Here? No, he went across country to a sale to get wire netting for our chickens. Oh, bring him back with him. No. <laughs> it turned out to be the wrong kind. Only 30 miles from London, aren't you, Mrs. Ralston? Only an hour by car, a little longer by train. I tell you, Giles wasn't in London. Just a minute, Mrs. Ralston. <coughs> this is your husband's coat. Yes. 
evening news, yesterday's. Sold on the streets about 3.30 yesterday afternoon. I don't believe it. Don't you? Don't you? Maury, you still need to Where is he? Where has he gone? Who? The sergeant. Did he went out that way. No. If only I could get away some way, somehow. There isn't any place for me to hide in the house. Hide? Yes, from him. Why? Oh, darling, they're all so frightfully against me. They're going to say I did these murders, particularly your husband. Never mind him. Listen, Christopher, you can't go on running away from things all your life. Why do you say that? It's true, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's quite true. You've got to grow up sometime, Chris. I wish I hadn't. Your name isn't really Christopher Wren, is it? No. And you're not really training to be an architect? No. Why did you call myself Christopher Wren? It amused me. <coughs> Then they all used to laugh at me in school and call me little Christopher Robin, Robin Wren Association of Ideas. It was hell being at school. What's your real name? We needn't go into that. I ran away whilst I was doing my army service. <coughs> it was all so beastly, I hated it. Yes. I'm just like the unknown murderer. I told you I was the one the specification fitted. You see, my mother... My, my, my mother... Yes, your mother. Everything would be all right if she hadn't died. She would have looked after me and, and took care of me. You can't go on being looked after all your life. That things happen to you and you've got to bear them. You've got to go on just as usual. <laughs> one can't do that. Yes, one can. You mean, you have? Yes. What was it? Something very bad? Something I've never forgotten. Was it to do with Giles? No, it was long before I met Giles. <clears throat> it must have been... Very young, almost a child. Perhaps that's why it was so <coughs> awful. It was horrible. Horrible. I tried to put it out of my mind. I tried to never think about it. So, you're running away too. Running away from things instead of facing them. Yes. Perhaps in a way. I am. Considering that I never saw you until yesterday, we seem to know each other rather well. <coughs> yes, it's rather odd, isn't it? I don't know. I suppose there's a sort of sympathy between us. <clears throat> anyway, you think I ought to stick it out? Well, frankly, what else can you do? I could pinch the sergeant's skis. I can ski quite well. That would be frankly stupid. It would be almost like admitting your guilt. Sergeant Trotter thinks I'm guilty. No, he doesn't. At least. I don't know what he thinks. I hate him, I hate him, I hate him! No. Sergeant Trotter, he puts these into your head, things that aren't true, things that can't possibly be true. Well, what is all this? I don't believe it. I won't believe it. What won't you believe? Come on, out with it. You see that? Yes. What is it? Yesterday's evening paper, a London paper, and it was in Giles's pocket. But Giles didn't go to London yesterday. Well, if he was here all day. But he wasn't. He went off in the car to look for chicken wire, but he couldn't find any. Well, that's all right. Uh, probably he did go to London after all. Then why shouldn't he tell me he did? Why pretend he'd been racing round the countryside? Or perhaps with the news of this murder. But he didn't know about the murder. Did he? Did he? Good Lord, Ronnie. You don't 
don't think. The sergeant doesn't think. I don't know what the sergeant thinks. And he can make you think things about people. You ask yourself questions and you begin to doubt. You feel that someone you love and know well might be a stranger. And that's what happens in a nightmare. You're somewhere in the middle of friends, <coughs> and suddenly you look up at their faces, and they're not your friends any longer. They are different people, just pretending. <coughs> Perhaps you can't trust anybody. Perhaps everybody's a stranger. I seem to be interrupting something. No! We were just talking. I must go into the kitchen. There's pie and potatoes. I must do the spinach. I'll come and give you a hand. No, you won't. Tete or tets aren't very healthy things at present. You keep out of the kitchen and keep away from my wife. Oh, not really. Keep away from my wife, Red. She's not going to be the next victim. Oh, so that's what you really think of me? I've already said so, haven't I? There's a killer loose in this house, and it seems to me you fit the bill. I'm not the only one to fit the bill. I don't see who else does. Oh, how blind you are, or do you just pretend to be blind? I tell you I'm worried about my wife's safety. So am I. I'm not going to leave you here alone with her. What the hell? Oh, please go, Chris. No, I'm not going. Please go, Chris. Please. I mean it. I shan't be far. Tony, what is all this? You must be crazy. Perfectly prepared to shut yourself up in the kitchen with a homicidal maniac. He isn't. You won't have to look at him to see his body. He isn't. He's just unhappy. I tell you, Giles, he isn't dangerous. I know that he was dangerous. And anyway, I can look after myself. That's what Mrs. Boyle said. Oh, Giles, don't. Look here. What is there between you and that wretched boy? What do you mean by between us? I'm sorry for him, that's all. Perhaps you met him before. Perhaps you suggested to him to come here and you both pretend to meet for the first time. All cooked up between you, wasn't it? Giles, have you gone out of your mind? How dare you suggest such things? Rather odd, isn't it? They should come and stay and out of the way place like this. No other than that Miss Casewell and Major Metcalf and Mrs. Boyle. I read once in a paper that these homicidal cases were able to attract me. Seems as though it were true. Where did you first go? How long has this been going on? You're being absolutely ridiculous. I never set eyes on Christopher Wren until he arrived yesterday. As you say, perhaps you can up to London to meet him on the slot. You know perfectly well I haven't been up to London for weeks. You haven't been up to London for weeks? Is that so? What on earth do you mean? It's quite true. Is it? Then what's this? One of the gloves you were wearing yesterday. You dropped it. I picked it up this afternoon when I was talking to Sergeant Trotter. You see what's inside? <clears throat> a London bus ticket. Oh, that. So it seems you didn't just go to the village yesterday. You went to London as well. All right. But well, I, I was safely away racing around the countryside. Whilst you were racing around the countryside. Oh, now admit, you went to London. All right. I went to London. So did you. What? So did you. You brought back an evening paper. Where did you put it back? It was in your overcoat pocket. Anyone put it there? Did they? No. You were in London. All right, I was in London. I didn't go to meet a woman there. Didn't you? Are you sure you didn't? What do you mean? Go away, don't touch me! What's the matter? Please, go away! Did you go to London yesterday to meet Christopher Wren? No, don't be a fool, of course I didn't. Why did you go? I. Shan't tell you that. Perhaps now I've forgotten why I went. Mm. <laughs> Boy, what's the with you? Different all of a sudden. I guess I don't know you anymore. Perhaps you never did know me. We've been married how long? A, a year? But you don't really know anything about me. What I've done or, or thought or felt or suffered before you knew me. Molly, you're crazy. All right then, I'm crazy. Why not? Perhaps it's fun to be crazy. What the hell are you on? Now, now. <laughs> I believe you young people are not saying more than you mean. Why are you so helpful in these lovers' quarrels? <laughs> lovers' quarrels, that's good. Quite so, quite so. I, I know just how you feel. I remember going through all this myself when I was a younger man. Gen X. 
Jeunesse, Jeunesse, as the poet says. Haven't been married long, have you? It's no business of yours, Mr. Porridge. No, <laughs> no business at all. But I just came in to say that Sergeant cannot find his skis. And I think he's very annoying. Chris, hmm. he wanted to ask if you have by any chance moved them, Mr. Ralston. No, yeah, of course not. Mr. Ralston, Mrs. Ralston. Have you removed my skis from the cupboard back there where we put them? Certainly not. Somebody's taken them. What made you happen to look for them? The snow is still lying. I need help here, reinforcements. I, I was going to ski over to the police station at Market Hampton to report on the situation. Oh, now you can't. I, dear, dear. <laughs> Someone has certainly made sure that you shan't do that, but there could be another reason why. Could there? Yes, what? Someone may be trying to get away. What did you mean when you said Dresden just now? No! Ah, so a young architect has hooked the guys and he very, very interesting. Is this true, Mrs. Ralston? Oh, thank goodness you have gone after all. Did you take my skis, Mr. Red? Your skis, Sergeant? Uh, uh, no, why should I? Mrs. Ralston seems to think Mr. That... Wren is very fond of skiing. I thought he may have taken them to get a little exercise. Exercise? Now listen, you people. This is a very serious matter. Somebody has removed my only chance of communication with the outside world. I want everybody in here at once. I think Miss Casewell went upstairs. Okay. I left Major Metcalf in the dining room. Major Metcalf. He's, he's not there now. I'll try and find him. Hello, watching me. It's a question of my skis. Skis? Mr. Ramston, have either of you two removed a pair of skis from the cupboard near the kitchen door? Good Lord, no. Why should I? And I didn't touch them. Well, nevertheless, they are gone. <coughs> Which way did you go back to your room? By the back stairs. Uh, then you passed by the cupboard door. If you say so, I've no idea where your skis are. Uh, and you, you were actually in that cupboard today? Yes. Yes, I was. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed, I had gone down to the cells. So did you see the skis in the cupboard when you passed through? I have no idea. Didn't you see them there? Well, I can't remember. You must remember if those skis were there. Yeah, there's no good shouting at the young fellow. I wasn't thinking of any skis. I was interested in the cellars. Architecture of this place is very interesting. Now, I saw the other door and I went down. So I can't say whether the skis were there or not. You realize that you, yourself, had an excellent opportunity of taking them. Yes. Yes, I can answer that. If I wanted to, that <clears throat> is. The question is, where are they now? Well, we ought to be able to find them if we all just set to. But it's not a case of the thimble. Whacking great things, skis. <laughs> Supposing we all set to. Not quite so far, Major Metcalf. That may be, you know, what we are meant to do. Hey, eh? I don't get you. And I'm in a position now where I've got to put myself in the place of a crazy, cunning brain. I've got to ask myself what he wants us to do and what he himself is planning to do next. I've got to try to keep just one step ahead of her, because if I don't, there's going to be another day. You still don't believe that. Yes, Miss Casewell, I do. The three blind mice, two mice cancelled out, a third mouse still to be dealt with. There are six of you here listening to me. One of you's the killer. One of you's the killer. I don't know which yet, but I shall. And another of you is the killer's prospective victim. That's the person I'm speaking to now. Mrs. Boyle held out on me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. You, whoever you are, are holding out on me. Well, don't. Because you're in danger. Nobody who's killed twice is going to hesitate to kill a third time. And as it is, I don't know which of you it is who needs protection. Come on now, anyone here who has anything, however slight, to reproach themselves for in that Bible business had better come out with it. All right, all right. 
what you want. I'll get the killer. I've no doubt of that, but it may be too late for one of you. And I'll tell you another thing. The killer's enjoying this. Oh, yes, he's enjoying himself a good deal. All right, you can go. with a soup son of fresh mustard. I will come with you to the kitchen, and we will see what we can concoct together. A charming occupation. Fine, helping my wife. Or the chief. Huh. The husband is a break for you. Quite natural, under the circumstances. He does not fancy you being alone with me. It is my sadistic tendencies he fears, not my dishonorable ones. Alas, what an inconvenience the husband always is. <laughs> Arrivadella. I'm so tired. Oh, he's very wise. Take no chances. Can I prove to you or to him or to our dogged sergeant that I am not a fucking psychomaniac? So difficult to prove a negative. And suppose that in fact I am really ding 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 ding. <laughs> oh, but such a gay little tune, don't you think? <laughs> She cut off their tails with a garden knife. <coughs> sneak, sneak, sneak. Delicious! Yeah. Just for the child for the dog. Ay, oh, cruel little things, children. Some of them never grow up. So frightened my wife was. It's silly of me, but you see, I found her. Her face was all purple. I can't forget it. Yes, it's difficult to forget things, isn't it? You aren't really the forgetting kind. Uh, I must go. The food, dinner, prepare the spinach, mm. and the potatoes are all going to pieces. Please, Charles. <laughs> what did you say to the lady to upset her, sir? Me, <clears throat> Sergeant. Oh, I was only having a little innocent fun. I'm always fond of the little joke. There's nice fun, and there's fun that's uh, not so nice. No, I don't wonder what you mean by that, Sergeant. Well, I've been doing a little wondering about you, sir. Indeed. I've been wondering about that car of yours and how it happened to overturn in a snowdrift so uh, conveniently. Hmm. Inconveniently, you mean, don't you, Sergeant? Well, that rather depends on the way you're looking at it. Just where were you bound for, by the way, when you had this little accident. Oh, uh, I was on my way to see a friend. Oh, in this neighborhood? Not very far from here. And what was the name and address of this friend? Now really, Sergeant, does that matter now? I mean, it has nothing to do with this current predicament, has it? We always like the fullest information. Now what did you say this friend's name was? I didn't say. No, you didn't, and it seems that you're not going to say. Now that's uh, very interesting. But there might be. In amor, but discretion. These jealous husbands. <laughs> Rather old to be running around with a lady at your time of life. My dear Sergeant Brother, I am not perhaps quite as old as I look. That's just what I've been thinking. <laughs> what? <laughs> that you may not be as old as you try to look. There's a lot of people trying to look younger than they are. If somebody goes about trying to look older, well, it does make one ask oneself why. Hmm. Having asked questions of so many people, you ask questions of yourself as well. Isn't that overdoing things? I might get an answer from myself. Don't get many from you. Well, well. Try again. That is, if you have any more questions to ask. One or two. Where were you coming from last night? That is simple, from London. What address in London? And we stay at the Ritz Hotel. Very nice, too, I'm sure. What 
What's your permanent address? I dislike permanency. Business or profession? I like to play the markets. Oh, a stockbroker? <laughs> no. No. Ah, you misunderstand me. <laughs> Enjoy this little game. Sure of yourself too, but I shouldn't be too sure. You're mixed up in a murder case, and don't you forget it. Murder isn't just fun and games. Not even this murder. <gasps> Dear me, you're very serious, Sergeant Trotta. Well, Mr. Policeman, you have no sense of humor. Is the Inquisition over? <clears throat> For the moment. Uh, for the moment, yes. I thank you so much. <laughs> I will go and look for your skis in the drawing room. Just in case someone has hidden them in the grand piano. <laughs> Just a minute, please. Were you speaking to me? Yes. Perhaps you come and sit down. Well, what do you want? Uh, you may have heard some of the questions I was asking Mr. Palavicini. I heard them. Like a little information from you. What do you want to know? Four men, please. Leslie, Margaret, Catherine, Casewell. Catherine. I spell it with a K. Quite so. Address? Villa Meraposa, Pine Dior, Mallorca. Oh, that's in Italy? It's an island. A Spanish island. And what is your address in England? Care of Morgan's Bank, Leadenhall Street. No other English address? No. And how long have you been in England, Miss Casewell? A week. And you've been staying since your arrival? At the Ledbury Hotel, Knightsbridge. What brings you to Monkswell Manor, Miss Casewell? I wanted somewhere quiet, in the country. How long did you, or do you, propose to remain here? I have finished what I came here to do. And uh, what was that? <clears throat> and what was that? Eh? What was it that you came here to do? I beg your pardon. I was, uh, I was thinking of something else. You haven't answered my question. I don't really see, you know, why I should. It's a matter that concerns me alone. Strictly private affair. All the same, Miss Case. No! No, I don't think we'll argue about it. Would you mind telling me your age? Not in the least. It's in my passport. I'm 24. 24? I'm thinking that I look older. That is quite true. Is there anyone in this country who can vouch for you? My bank will reassure you as to my financial position. I can also refer you to a solicitor, a very discreet man. I am not in a position to offer you a social reference. I have lived most of my life abroad. In Mallorca? In Mallorca, and other places. Were you born abroad? No. I left England when I was 13. You know, Miss Case, my life, can't quite make you out. Does it matter? I don't know. What are you doing here? It seems to worry me. It does worry me. You say you went abroad when you were 13. 12, 13, they're about. Was your name Casewell then? It's my name now. What was your name then? Come on, tell me. What are you trying to prove? I want to know what your name was when you left England. It's a long time ago. I forgot it. There are things one doesn't forget. Possibly. Unhappiness. Despair. I dare say. What is your real name? I told you. Leslie Margaret Catherine Casewell. Catherine. What the hell are you doing I... here? I always thought police weren't allowed to give people the third degree. I have really been interrogating Miss Casewell. You seem to have upset her. What are you doing? It's, it's nothing, it's just. It's all this murder. It's so horrible that it came over me suddenly. I'll just have. Uh, I'll just go up to my room. Oh, it's impossible. Oh, oh, I can't believe it. What can't you believe? Six impossible things before breakfast, like the Red Queen? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, it's rather like that. Good Lord. You look as though you've seen a ghost. I've seen something that I ought to have seen before. 
Blind as a bat, I've been. But now, now we may be able to get somewhere. The police have a clue. Yes, Mr. Wren asked. The police have a clue. I want everyone to assemble in here again. Do you know where they are? Molly and Giles are in the kitchen. I've been with Major Metcalf looking for your skis. We looked in the most entertaining places, but all to no avail. I don't know where Pyro the Genie is. Oh, okay, here. You, get the others. Mr. Pyro the Genie! Pyro the Genie! Yes, Sergeant. What can I do for you? Little of a policeman cannot find his skis and does he know where to find them? Aye, leave them alone and then come home, dragging a man that are behind them. Here, well, here's all this. Sit down, Major. Mrs. Ralston. Must I come now? It's very inconvenient. There are things more important than meals, Mrs. Ralston. Mrs. Boyle, for instance, won't want another meal. <laughs> That's a very tactless way of putting things, Sergeant. I'm sorry, but I want cooperation, and I intend to get it. Mr. Ralston, will you go up and ask Miss Casewell to come down again? She just went up in her room. Tell her of a lonely bee for a few minutes. Have your skis been found, Sergeant? No, Mrs. Ralston, but I may say I have a very shrewd suspicion of who took them and of why they were taken. I won't say any more at the present moment. Aye, please don't. <laughs> I always thought explanations should be kept to the very end. That exciting last chapter, you know. <laughs> this isn't a game, sir, isn't it? Now there, I think you're wrong. I think it is a game to somebody, and you think the murderer is enjoying himself. Maybe, maybe. What is happening? Sit down, Miss Casewell. Mrs. Ralston. Now, will you all pay attention, please? You may remember that after the murder of Mrs. Boyle, I took statements from you all. These statements related to your positions at the time the murder was committed. These statements were as follows. Mrs. Ralston in the kitchen. Mr. Parabicini playing the piano in the drawing room. Mr. Ralston in his bedroom. Mr. Wren, dinner. Miss Casewell in the library. Major Metcalf in the cellar. Correct. Those were the statements you made. I had no means of checking these statements at the time. They may be true. They may not. To put it quite clearly, five of those statements are true. But one is false. Which one? Five of you were speaking the truth, but one of you was lying. I have a plan that may help me discover the liar, and if I discover that one of you lied to me, then I will know who the murderer is. Not necessarily. Someone may have lied for some other reason. I rather doubt that. What's the idea? You just said you had no need to check in these statements. No, but supposing everyone was to go through these actions a second time. Oh, that old chestnut. A reconstruction of the crime. Not a reconstruction of the crime, Mr. Parmigini. A reconstruction of the movements of apparently innocent persons. And what do you expect to learn from that? You will forgive me if I don't make that clear just at the moment. You want a repeat performance? Yes, Mr. Ralston, I do. It's a trap. What do you mean? It's a trap. It's a trap, I know it is. I only want people to do exactly what they did before. But I don't see what they do. I can't see what, what you can hope to discover just by making people do the same things they did before. I think it's just nonsense. Do you, Mr. Wren? Well, you can count me out. I'm far too busy in the kitchen. I can't count anyone out. One might almost believe that you're all guilty by the looks of you. Why are you all so unwilling? Of course. <laughs> what you say goes, Sergeant. We'll all cooperate. Eh, hey, Molly? Very well. Wren? Miss Casewell? Yes. Parvichini? Oh, yes, I consent. Metcalf? <laughs> yes. Are we to do exactly what you did before? The same actions will be performed, yes. Uh, then I will go back to the drawing room and point out with one finger the signature to an of the murderer. Ding, ding, ding. Got not quite so fast, Mr. Parvichini. Mrs. Ralston, do you play the piano? <coughs> yes, I do. And you know the tune of Three Blind Mice. <coughs> uh, then you could pick it out with one finger, just as Mr. Parmigini did? Good. Go into the drawing room, sit at the piano, and be ready to play when I give you the signal. Uh, but, uh, Sergeant, I understood <coughs> that we are each to repeat our former roles. <laughs> well, the same actions will be performed. 
but not necessarily by the same people. Uh, thank you. This is Ralston. I don't see the point. There is a point. It is a means of checking up on the original statements, and there may be one statement in particular. Now, if you will all pay attention, I will assign each of you your new stations. Um, Mr. Ray, will you go into the kitchen? Just keep an eye on Mrs. Ralston's dinner for her. You're very fond of cooking, I believe. <coughs> uh, Mr. Pivotin, will you go up to Mr. Ray? <coughs> By the back stairs is the most convenient way. Major Metcalf, will you go up to Mr. Ralston's room and examine the telephone there? Uh, Mrs. Casewell, would you mind going down to the cellars? Mr. Ray will show you the way. Unfortunately, I need someone to reproduce my own actions. I'm sorry to ask of you, Mr. Ralston, but would you go out by that window and trace the telephone wire around near the front door? Uh, rather a chilly job, but I suppose you're the toughest person here. And what are you going to do? I am mm. enacting the part of Mrs. Boyle. Taking a bit of a risk, aren't you? You'll all stay in your places and remain there until you hear me call you. Glad the Logains. Your objection to my very could. I should advise it, but, uh... uh take my torch, sir. It's behind the curtain. Mrs. Ralston, count to twenty and then begin to play. Ralston. Mrs. Ralston. Yes, what is it? You're looking very pleased with yourself. Have you got what you wanted? Yes. Yes, I've got exactly what I wanted. You know who the murderer is? Yes, yes. I know. Well, which one of them? You ought to know, Mrs. Ralston. I? Yes. You've been extraordinarily foolish, you know. You've run a very good chance of being killed by holding out on me. As a result, you've been in serious danger more than once. I don't know what you mean. Come now, Mrs. Ralston. We policemen aren't quite so dumb as you think. All along, I've realized that you had a first-hand knowledge of the Longridge farm affair. You knew Mrs. Boyle was the magistrate concerned. In fact, you knew all about it. Why didn't you speak up and say so? I don't understand. I want you to forget. Forget. Your maiden name was Waring. Yes. Miss Waring, you taught school. At the school where those children went. Yes. It's true, isn't it, that Jimmy, the child who died, managed to get a letter posted to you. A letter that begged for help. Help from his kind young teacher. You never answered that letter. I couldn't. I never got it. You just didn't bother. That's not true. I was ill. I went down with the pneumonia that very day. The letter was my design with others. It was weeks afterwards that I found it with a lot of other letters, and by then, a child <coughs> was dead. Dead. Waiting for me to do something. Hoping. Gradually losing hope. Oh, it's haunted me ever since. If only I hadn't been ill. If only I'd known. <coughs> oh, it's monstrous. 
Yes. It's monstrous. I thought police didn't carry revolvers. The police don't. I'm not a policeman, Mrs. Ralston. You thought I was a policeman because I rang up from a call box and said I was speaking from police headquarters and that Sergeant Trotter was on his way. I cut the telephone wires before I came to the front door. You know who I am, Mrs. Ralston. I'm Georgie, Jimmy's brother. Georgie, you better not scream, Mrs. Ralston, because if you do, I shall fire this revolver. I'd like to talk with you a minute. Yes, I said I'd like to talk with you a minute. Jimmy Dunn, that nasty, cruel woman killed him. They put her in prison. Prison wasn't bad enough for her. I said I'd kill her one day. I did, too, in the fall. It was great fun. I hope Jimmy knows. I'll kill them all when I've grown up. That's what I said to myself. Because grown-ups can do anything they like. I'm going to kill you in a minute. You better not. You'll never get safely away from them. Oh, someone's hidden my skeet. I can't find them, but it doesn't matter. I don't really mind if I get away or not. I'm tired. It's all been such fun, though, watching you all, uh, pretending to be a policeman. That revolver will make a lot of noise. It will, rather. Uh, much better to do it the usual way. And take you by the neck. Last little mouse in the trap. Georgie! Georgie! Georgie, you know me, don't you? Don't you remember the farm, Georgie? The animals. That fat old pig. The, the day the bull chased us across the field. And the dogs. Dogs? Yes. Spot and plain. Kathy? Yes. Kathy, you remember me now, don't you? Kathy, it is you. I... What are you doing here? I came to England to find you. I didn't recognize you until you twirled your hair the way you always used to. Yes, you always did it. Would you come with me? You're coming with me. Where are we going? It's all right, Georgie. I'm taking you somewhere where they'll look after you and see that you won't do any more harm. Ralston! Ralston! Bully! Bully! Are you alright? Oh, Who would have dreamt it was Trotter? He's mad, quite mad. Yes, but you! I was mixed up in it all. I taught in the school. It wasn't my fault, but he thought I could have saved that child. You should have told me. I wanted to forget. There. It's all under control. He'll be unconscious soon with the sedative. His sister's looking after him. And poor fellow's mad as a hatter, of course. I've suspected him all along. You did? Didn't you believe he was a policeman? I knew he wasn't a policeman. You say it, Mrs. Ralston. I am a policeman. <laughs> uh, as soon as we got hold of that notebook with Monswell Manor written in it, we saw it was vital, perhaps, on the spot. When I was put to him, Major Madcalf agreed to let me take his place. I, I couldn't understand it, but Trotter turned up. And Casewell is the sister. Yes, yeah, she recognized him just before this last business. Didn't know what to do about it, but fortunately came to me just in time. Well, it's, uh, it's beginning to thaw. Help will be here soon. <laughs> oh, oh uh, now, Mrs. Ralston, I'll remove those skis. I hid them on top of the four posts. And I thought it was part of the cheating. I will examine that car of his rather carefully. I should be surprised if there were a thousand or so Swiss watches in the spare wheel. Yes, that's his line of business. Nasty bit of goods. Molly, I believe you thought I was. Just 
What were you doing in London yesterday? Darling, I was buying you an anniversary present. We've been married just a year today. That's what I went to London for, and I didn't want you to know. Yeah. The cigars. I do hope they're all right. Darling, how sweet of you. They're splendid. Will you smoke them? I'll smoke them. <laughs> What's my present? I also got one out of it. Just for best. Oh, how lovely, darling. Well, um, little, but my hair's done properly. You do like it, don't you? And the girl in the shop said it was the last thing in hats. <laughs> Mrs. Ralston! Mrs. Ralston, there's a terrible smell of burning coming from the kitchen. <gasps> my pie! <laughs> <laughs> 